Well, this is the last talk. Uh, I'd like to join all the other speakers to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Timo, Ruth, uh, Charlie, and uh, Alan, for putting together this really stimulating um, uh, you know, conference. Uh, so in the spirit of the workshop, uh, I prepared this short presentation to hopefully bring um, you know, together some pieces from the previous presentations uh, and focus on one particular theme, maybe two. Uh, first the theme is that how far we can go uh, if we assume that there is indeed a canonical circuit that applies to all cortical areas. Um, including prefrontal cortex. And the second thing that uh, already uh, has been discussed uh, in, in previous talks is this uh, kind of renewed debate about um, functional localization versus distributed processes, right? Uh, and, and hopefully uh, that can also uh, shed insight uh, into how PFC might work together with the rest of the brain. So, like everybody else, we have been interested in um, prefrontal functions. Uh, in particular, we wondered what really enables an area like this, uh, you know, to subserve cognitive function, as in contrast to, say, early sensory coding and processing, like primary visual cortex. So we like to contrast PFC with V1. Um, and again, um, you know, follow the footsteps of pioneers like uh, Fuster and Gunnar Kish. Uh, we have very much, uh, you know, focusing on working memory, which in some sense can be thought of as the, uh, if you like, uh, hydrogen atom of cognition. It's really the basic, basic uh, cognitive function, right? That's required for many um, types of uh, behavioral flexibility. Um, so it turns out that the kind of neural second model designed to try to understand the mechanism for stimulus uh, selective persistent activity that self sustain during a delay period in a delay dependent task um, is applicable to decision making. So it turns out that the, the kind of uh, local circuit model uh, that we and others um, you know, uh, developed uh, can be applied to both working memory and decision making. So here's a very concrete example. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this perceptual decision making task where you're shown a display of random dots and your job is to judge the net motion direction of this pattern, uh, say upward A versus downward B. And the trick is to change from child to child the fraction of dots that move together called motion strength or coherence. Right. Uh, imagine that you are asked to make such a judgment when the coherence is very low, so the inputs are very ambiguous, and then you have to hold in your working memory your uh, decision, your choice, for, uh, you know, through a delay period. So this kind of requirement would combine decision making with uh, working memory. So what's shown here um, on the on the right here are, are two individual trial simulations of this uh, biological based spiking neural uh, network model. Uh, just to illustrate uh, two salient features of such a circuit, right? On one hand, it has this ability to show uh, very uh, gradual quasi-linear ramping activity on a time scale of a second or so, which has been shown by people like Mike Shadlin to underline accumulation of information in favor uh, of uh, different options uh, leading to a categorical choice. And the choice here is done through winner take all competition by attractor dynamics. And it's the same attractor dynamics that uh, can maintain the uh, you know, choice uh, signal across a delay period. Right, so there's this duality between attractor dynamics and slow transient. Uh, because the circuit is biologically based, you can go from this recurrent population dynamics to behavior, like accuracy and reaction time as functional motion strength. And you can also go down to assess what really underlines slow reverberation. Right. Uh, in this case, we suggest that it's uh, dependent on an MDA receptor uh, mediated recurrent excitation in such a local circuit. And there is some evidence from Amy Einstein's uh, lab uh, in support of this uh, idea. So uh, this all happens, the slow reverberation um, mechanism happens 
and you can have this working memory and decision-making uh, capabilities when the recurrent excitation is strong enough, as shown uh, schematically. Actually, it's coming from the model uh, and shown here. Uh, so uh, along the x-axis is the strength of recurrent excitation. It has to be a, above a threshold level in order for this type of functionality to emerge, okay? And this is the first example, I guess, um, you know, from local second model uh, that some, I really like the, the phrase from uh, uh, Jessica and Cotton, um, Catalan, uh, that the differences in degree can lead to differences in kind, right? So here you have differences in degree can lead to, uh, you know, the emergence of uh, functional connectivity, uh, capability um, through what's called bifurcation mathematically. Right? This is a well-defined mathematical phenomena that occurs only in uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. So um, we, um, over the years, have been uh, trying to uh, work with experimentalists and to look at different aspects of frontal functions. Uh, let me give you a few examples uh, coming from recent year research, um, very much actually helped by uh, machine learning tools. So in this example, we asked how prefrontal cortex might represent the tasks, right? So uh, Robert Young, as a graduate student, trained a single neural network to do 20 different cognitive tasks. Uh, that are uh, commonly used in monkey experiments. And that enabled us to you know, look at how uh, task representations are uh, you know, uh, organized in a local circuit. Uh, another uh, interesting recent study by uh, Vishwa, the same Vishwa that Adrian uh, talked about, uh, is how a area like medial uh, prefrontal cortex, perhaps in collaboration with the interplay with uh, hippocampus, can form so-called schema in psychology. That uh, is a, a term to describe how our brain might acquire knowledge in order to speed up learning. Right, so this is a schema formation uh, in learning to learn task where the system learns to solve a series of problems and, and indeed the system gets better and better and faster and faster. Uh, and that's saying, uh, that's really uh, uh, because there's a formation of a schema in terms of neural population activity. Uh, another example is uh, variation in economical choice uh, that depends on uh, OFC, perhaps also uh, ACC. Um, so that involves uh, reinforcement learning uh, in, in such a local circuit. And finally, um, you, um, you know, look at a, how a neural circuit can really learn to perform uncued task switching that uh, involve ACC and perhaps also DLPFC. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip the details of each of these stories. I'd be happy to go into more details uh, offline if you're interested. Uh, but I want to spend the rest of the time to uh, you know, tackle another line of challenge. So this line, if you like, is trying to understand uh, neural circuits, uh, neural circuit uh, mechanism and the computation of principles of uh, different kinds of building blocks, right? Perhaps, increasingly more complicated building, building blocks of cognition, in perhaps eventually including uh, symbols, including compositionality. Uh, in fact, the first uh, paper I mentioned actually tackles uh, the issue of compositionality in terms of task representations. Um, so the other challenge is uh, what uh, uh, Jorge uh, Marias mentioned, namely we, um, I guess as a field, increasingly realized that, uh, you know, when we talk about functional specificity, um, we don't mean that necessarily a function is localized in a tiny piece of the brain, right? Uh, so there is a subset of localized brain regions that may be engaged in a particular cognitive functions, uh, in a particular cognitive function like working memory. Um, similarly, uh, this is a study uh, of decision making, uh, context dependent decision making. When you record from uh, multiple brain regions, in this case, six or so, uh, six or seven uh, cortical areas, you pretty much can decode uh, the behavioral attributes uh, from all these areas uh, to some degree. Right? So the question is, how can we understand distributed cognitive functions and how can we go from local circuits to large scale systems? 
Well, uh, in that effort, uh, we collaborated with uh, Henry Kennedy uh, when his group uh, back then published this uh, very exciting uh, new database of area-to-area -area, uh, cortical connectivity in the mechanical cortex. So uh, Henry mentioned uh, you know, um, his work, so I'm going to skip the details, except to say that uh, uh, it's very exciting uh, database. Uh, the connectivity at the level of cortical-cortical communication um, is very very dense, about 65, 67% of all connections are present. So whatever I'm gonna show you is coming from such a model with a lot of feedback loops, right? Uh, and the connection weights are, direct, are directed and they span five orders of magnitude. And finally, there's this uh, exponential distance rule. That means that uh, you know nodes are really not just um, you know, nodes of a topological graph, right? You really have to think about spatial um, uh, embedding uh, of such a cortical system. Now, suppose that I take this connectivity matrix, again, directed and weighted, and I want to build a large scale multi-regional dynamical model for say, working memory, right? Uh, so one thing, you know, you have to decide is what you're going to uh, incorporate in each local circuit. Right. Um, so the answer should depends on the questions you you want to investigate. Uh, so here, for the purpose of discussion for the, this workshop in particular, it's relevant to assume that there is a canonical local circuit that's repeated, right, many times, as advocated by say Douglas and Martin, and and uh, it's really a major tenant in neuroscience. Now, if that's the case, how can I explain functional modularity? Right. Okay. And maybe part of the answer would be input output, right? PFC gets very different inputs, right? Project to different outputs uh, than um, uh, V1, for example. That certainly is, um, is uh, part of the uh, answer. But I'm going to fo focus on something else, which is uh, heterogeneity. Right? So there are variations of biological properties uh, that have been shown by several speakers here and it's known uh, for a long time. Uh, what's new, what's interesting is that uh, these days you can quantify uh, biological uh, variations across cortical areas. And I'm gonna show you a few examples how you can quantify such uh, biological properties, especially those that are uh, important for synaptic excitation and inhibition and dopamine modulation. Uh, those are, uh, you, you know, close to our heart, right? Uh, when we think about uh, cortical functions, and finally, that's where this, uh, you know, slogan uh, kicks in. Differences in degree will potentially lead to differences in kind, and through bifurcations. All right, so that's uh, what I want to show you. So what do I mean by microscopical gradient? Uh, um, uh, Jorge already mentioned an example of spine count uh, from the work of Elston in collaboration with his colleagues uh, at the Cajau Institute, uh, you know, Javier and, uh, and, and the Ruth. Um, and, and so if you now plot the spine count, as function of the hierarchy quantified by Henry Kennedy's group, you see this very interesting uh, systematical change. Right, uh, and as you know, there's only one excitatory synapse per spine. So we took this as a proxy for the strength of excitation per neuron, right? And that's going to change from area to area. So canonical circuit that means mathematically in the model that you use the same mathematical equation. Spine count means that there's a number that changes from area to area that describes the strength of excitation. Does that mean, does that make sense? Okay, same canonical circuit, quantitative different, uh, you know, parameter values, if you like, across the area in the system. Now, here's another example of uh, uh, microscopical gradient by John Murray. So he analyzed the gene expression of, um, you know, genes that may be coding subunits of AMD receptors, right? And here, the x-axis, is the T1, T2 ratio, as uh, Jorge showed, that goes down with hierarchy, right? And you see that, uh, for example, this uh, gene that encodes NR2B subunit of AMD receptors uh, shows this uh, nice uh, gradient, uh, increasing gradient along the hierarchy, right? And so the strength and the amount of, uh, of AMD receptors, um, um, may, this is a gene, of course, uh, not really receptors, uh, uh, but the, 
hopefully related to receptor uh, function, right? Uh, in fact, uh, do show this uh, microscopical gradients. Uh, another interesting gradient is uh, about inhibition. So what's shown here, uh, this is my data now, uh, in red is the um, yeah, PV neuron density, and in black is PV divided by PV uh, and uh, SST uh, interneurons, right? And so to simplify, PV neurons control outputs of PM cells, and SST neurons that target dendrites control the inputs to PM cells, right? So in some sense, this uh, black curve, uh, rank ordered, uh, measures uh, to what extent in each area along the x-axis, you have in proportion more input controlling versus output controlling interneurons, right? And uh, naturally you'd see that uh, early sensory areas tend to cluster here that have a lot more output controlling interneurons, whereas uh, higher areas like uh, frontal areas tend to have a lot more SST uh, positive input controlling interneurons. Right, so this would, you know, be a another gradient, microscopical gradient of uh, 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 interneuron um, um, distribution, if you like, uh, along the hierarchy. Now, uh, one more example of uh, microscopical gradient um, is um, um, about. Uh, receptor labeling uh, data from uh, um, the lab of uh, uh, Nicola uh, Palmaro uh, Galaga, who is here, uh, and, uh, and this is the work of Shang, who is also present. Uh, so what you see here is that uh, D1 receptor uh, labeling density per single cell uh, shows this very nice uh, gradient along the cortical hierarchy. Right. Um, so if you incorporate um, you know, a gradient like this, like the spine count gradient, uh, in such a dynamical model now, in which again, each local circuit is described by uh, identical mathematical equation with different parameter values of excitatory neurons, inhibiting neurons, um, we observed this um, emergence of a hierarchy of time constants that was described uh, yesterday uh, uh, in the context of mice experiments. Um, so, um, and that was, you know, uh, in fact, and certainly not uh, uh, put in by hand. It kind of emerged, emerges from from this model, and from from there we uh, moved on to look at different, um, you know, kinds of questions. Uh, but uh, I will just focus on distributed uh, working memory uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so here, um, I'm going to repeat a little bit. Uh, what Ho uh, just talked to you about, uh, but maybe with uh, a couple of uh, additional comments. So he used uh, for each local circuit, exactly the same local circuit model I described to you at the very beginning of the talk, right? Two selective excitatory neuron populations, one inhibitory neuron population. And now the strength of excitation is going to obey this gradient across the hierarchy. And here's an example that he showed, uh, um, you know, just uh, um, what, um, uh, a while ago. And this is the activity map doing a brief uh, stimulus representation uh, and that is confined in the posterior part of the cortex. And during the delay, when there's no input, uh, you see uh, self-sustained persistent activity uh, that involves multiple uh, cortical areas. Right, uh, parietal, frontal, and, and temporal uh, areas. So this is one example of a spatially distributed attractor state. Um, we, for this line of research so far, focuses on space, right? Um, but one thing that uh, I want to uh, mention is that in fact, uh, in the same system, you could have many different attractor states that engage different subsets of areas. Uh, as shown here uh, with three, uh, six different examples, right? So each one is a self-sustained attractor state involving different subsets of cortical areas. And each one may be potentially interesting for different uh, internally, uh, you know, um, you know, maintained processes, right? Okay, uh, what that is depends on, you know, how we can find out and, and how each area connects uh, with uh, what input and output, um, you know, uh, systems. So how that thought is gonna be important um, for what I'm gonna say uh, in a minute. 
Um, I want to also just to mention again, uh, Sean's work. Uh, this slide is really not doing the justice. It's uh, kind of repeating what Ho Hei said, that, um, that the model actually can capture most of the um, uh, results reported by this data uh, meta-analysis uh, for uh, macaque monkey experiments. It's not doing the justice to Sean's work because A, this version of the model actually has different cell types, including three kinds of inhibited neurons in each local circuit. And B, it incorporates this uh, gradient of D1 receptor uh, uh, mediated modulation by dopamine, right? Uh, so uh, with this uh, additional uh, richness, in principle, we can examine more questions, including the one, for example, that Andrea Nader talked to you about. Now, let me contrast this with mice, right? Uh, of course, uh, you have a lot more data and you have a lot more tools to do uh, mouse experiments as illustrated here by recent uh, data release from the International Brain Lab. So it makes sense to also consider um, uh, a mouse model uh, for which you have also cortical cortical connectivity matrix. You also have some uh, quantification of hierarchy although it's still in the works. There's some kind of controversy that Henry can tell you more about. Now, one thing I want to highlight is, um, you know, apparently um, if you compare monkey V1 and PFC in red and purple, you do see a big difference in terms of the spine count, right? Uh, more in PFC than in V1. But if you do exactly the same analysis uh, for V1 and the frontal area in mice, you don't see anything, right? Uh, light versus dark blue. Okay, that means that in our model, at least, uh, we cannot really uh, assume, right, there's a gradient of spine count per pyramid cell in mice. Uh, we also did genetic analysis uh, in mice. We did not find a gradient of uh, uh, gene that uh, encodes in R2B uh, subunit over MD receptors. So instead, um, we decided to focus on this gradient of inhibition. Right, so uh, early sensory areas have a lot more PV, uh, you know, output controlling the neurons, and they uh, probably, um, you know, have a very powerful influence on stabilizing network, suppressing pyramidal cell activity if necessary. Uh, and that's the one also Yan Dan uh, emphasized in her talk. Uh, so we asked, what if we have a mouse model with connectivity from the connectomic data analysis, and then incorporate uh, this kind of uh, gradient of inhibition. And that's the work uh, done by graduate student Xin Yu, uh, Xin Yu Din. Uh, sometimes we also incorporate Thalamus in, in, in his work, and this just was put on archive. By the way, Xiang also played a big role in, in this line of research. So here's an example of um, uh, a single cell uh, simulation of a uh, visual delayed response task. And here you see that uh, V1, for example, uh, responds quickly to a brief input, but uh, when input is gone, the activity uh, usually does not linger around for a long time, but some other areas show uh, sustained activity. I forgot to say, maybe Jorge also said it, but uh, I want to repeat, both in the monkey simulation I showed you, and in this example, we assumed that if you disconnect areas, none of the isolated areas can show delayed activity, okay? And you say PFC neurons always show delayed activity in, in the real experiments, uh, but then I will respond and saying that you don't know if that's really produced locally, right? It could still depend on long distance connection loops between PFC and maybe parietal area, maybe some other areas, right? So we, we of course, can change the parameters so that some local areas are capable of persistent activity and decision-making uh, computations, which actually have some reason to believe is the case, but it's a pure good example in modeling uh, to look at the emergent uh, uh, persistent activity pattern when none of the isolated local circuit uh, can generate persistent activity.
right? And so this is the case here with the mouse model as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time. This paper really, I think uh, I'm excited by part of this paper, especially because we dissect out the kinds of circuit, local areas that show delay activity, which can be source, really areas, key areas, if you de deactivate by optogenetic manipulation, those areas, the position activity will be gone, or it could be read out the area, right? You deactivate that particular area, uh, actually you don't affect the working memory storage, et cetera, right? And so you can do optogenetic manipulation, so to speak, uh, in such a circuit, and again, remember, there are a lot of loops here, right? You, Manipulate one area, you're going to affect many other areas through loops. So this computational platform, I think, is going to be useful in collaboration with people who do experiments. But anyway, um, I just want to get to, to the gist of the um, uh, theoretical uh, proposal here. Uh, uh, as you would expect here, if I plot the fine rate, uh, in this uh, distributed working memory re representation as a function of the PV density for each area, you see, you uh, as you would expect intuitively, some kind of negative correlation, right? Uh, and again, system is complicated. Uh, the actual pattern depends on the PV density. It depends on the, uh, you know, for each area, uh, how many recurrent connection loops you are part of. Right, so we use the graph theoretical measures that are cell type specific uh, to predict, uh, you know, how each area might be involved in um, in in working memory representation. If I use graph theory measures about loops that don't into, take into consideration of cell type specific kind of projections, we don't get anything. That's why you see this. Um, um, you know, part of the title that the connectome needs to be cell type specific. So um, if I plot the fine rate during the delay period, during working memory, um, as a function of the hierarchy, both for macaque and for mice, we see nicely that areas that are engaged in working memory representation are separated from areas that are not by a gap in the fine rate. Right, so that it looks like a bit similar to the local bifurcation diagram I showed you near the beginning of the talk, right? So we would like to understand, is that really some kind of bifurcation in space in this case, right? Because this is a, you know, you have a cortex along the hierarchy. So you have a really cortical space here, hierarchy hierarchical space, and apparently there's some kind of bifurcation that occurs in the middle of the uh, hierarchy, right? Is that a bifurcation in terms of mathematics? Um, because this is a relevant and interesting to understand the modularity, right? Uh, just to back off a little bit, uh, remember that I would assume that you have this canonical circuit, right? I'm repeating myself a little bit, but you have this uh, gradient of uh, properties, so maybe this is all you need to understand how novel functionality emerges only in a subset of areas, not in all systems at the same time, right? So to understand the bifurcation space should, in principle, uh, be useful uh, to, you know, biologically speaking, to really have some general idea, um, you know, how, how modularity really emerges with this uh, uh, canonical circuit uh, principle. One more thing is that this should happen for each attractor state, right? If you have many attractor states in the same system, this bifurcation would be up associated with each attractor state. So you have many bifurcations in the brain, if you like, right? Now, uh, if I can, I have only like two slides uh, to uh, reiterate a little bit what um, Peter uh, talked to you about. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, ignition in a simple detection task, right? Uh, so you're familiar with this idea that if you say tune a stimulus near detection threshold with the same physical stimulation to the retina, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. And uh, work by uh, Stan Dehan and others uh, showed that uh, using say ECOG recording or MEG, that uh, if you say you don't see it, the signal is confined in the uh, venture, in the uh, um, 
in the ventral part of the uh, visual system, where when you say you see it, uh, sometimes you see this global uh, ignition, right, uh, triggered by the access to PFC. Um, so we focused on Peter's uh, new experiment uh, with uh, some expansion, and this is the work by a rotation student, or sorry, not really a gap year student, uh, Ulysses, uh, supervised by Sean, uh, with some additional um, assumptions, uh, you know, in the same working memory uh, model that I talked to you about, and that uh, reproduces the salient observations uh, from uh, Peter's uh, uh, experiment, in particular. Uh, in DLPFC, you see there's four types of trials. Um, the uh, heat trial uh, shows this, um, you know, switching activity. Uh, in mist trial, the activity is low. Uh, when you don't show stimulus, uh, usually the activity is low, corresponding to correct rejection in black, but sometimes uh, the false alarm occurs because it actually uh, do um, uh, see this, uh, um, um, kind of a switching on of uh, prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain, if you like. Uh, that does happen in single trials through a very quick binary switch. But the switching time occurs randomly from trial to trial. And that's why across trials, you see this ramping activity, um, you know, as a result of the trial average, as you see here in the experiment. Peter said that, in fact, that this is what they believe is happening in the real uh, uh, system. Um, and I'll be very keen to, um, you know, hopefully find out how this might really uh, be tested experimentally, either with monkeys or maybe in, in some other species. Um, and another thing that you can study uh, with this kind of model is what areas might be more important than others to uh, change the false alarm rates, right? Okay, I don't think that's uniformly distributed again. Uh, so maybe uh, you can pinpoint the sources of air, source areas that somehow um, play a oversized role in generating false alarms. Those may be the same areas that can generate uh, sometimes hallucinations, right? There's nothing out there, but you think you see something or you hear something. So let me end by uh, summarizing one punchline or take home message uh, to, to you know um, you know discuss, namely uh, if there are no real this is a if and we know there are novelties, right? Certainly between species and maybe across different parts of the cortex, but under the assumption that you have this canonical circuit and you have more or less the same uh, wiring, right? Across uh, the cortex. And you also assume there are several microscopical gradients or biological properties that are functionally important by, you know, for excitation, for inhibition, for dopamine modulation, for serotonin. Uh, we have uh, exciting new data, uh, again, with uh, Nicola and Xiang, that serotonin receptor uh, labeling density also show uh, a, a gradient, actually not along the same axis. Uh, and so if you have multiple microscopical gradients, right, low dimensional, quantifiable uh, variations, and then on top of that, quantification um, you know, leads to potentially this uh, bifurcation phenomena, right? And I think that's an interesting way to think about how modularities uh, might be explained uh, in uh, together uh, with this uh, general uh, uh, cortical organization. Thank you so much.